All right. Well, last week, Pastor Jason shared a lot of really good things, uh, repeated some of the words that Pastor Kerry has shared, some of the words that uh, you guys have all turned in. And so for me, what I want to do tonight is follow up on one of the things that he had shared, one of the, the words that Kerry has given. And I'll go ahead and read it, and then I'll kind of explain what we're going to do. Uh, so this is one of the many things that uh, Pastor Jason shared. I heard the Lord say that I am making this city Salina to be a city of refuge for the days to come. How many know that's good news? That Salina is going to be one of the places that God wants to mark as a place that he's going to visit and stay. There were places in scripture where God would make cities of refuge, and the deal was that if somebody had committed a crime somewhere, say a murderer, in order to keep the family from going and killing him, he would go to that city of refuge so he would be protected until they would come and have justice or whatever needed to happen out of that. I believe that there are cities of refuge where God is going to put his name, put his presence in such a way that the people will come because they find not a refuge from civil crimes, but a place where they can get free from demonic stru structures and stuff that's attacking them. That's awesome. That Salina is going to be a place where people are coming to get free from the demonic or just whatever that is that's attacking them. So just get a word, get ready, because God is raising up the city. He's definitely raising this church up to lead as a city of refuge where you will find some strange people, <laughs> get ready for some strange people, uh, which, yep, some strange people will be coming in, and we will know that they are here. They, might, they may be just driving through, uh, but they're going to end up picking up their whole family and moving their family here. Wow. That is awesome. Now, I don't know if you noticed, but even on this past Sunday, we had a lot of visitors. A lot of visitors. We ran out of uh, visitor cards on Sunday. That's a good problem. And there were people here who had never been here before, and they were just driving by. And then I had one of the visitors who, this is, I think, maybe their second Sunday here. He came up and said, we were going to go church shopping, but we found our home. That's on week two of them going church shopping. They said, we don't need to go anywhere else. We found our home. And we were just driving through. Ain't that fascinating? The end of this, this uh, sentence here. They'll be just driving through, and they'll just pick up and move their whole family here. And they brought their whole family, you know, their, their, their children as well, all here. So, uh, so what I want to do tonight is apply the principles of hermeneutics uh, to this passage. Uh, so those of you who are in hermeneutics class or those who took it um, last year or the year before, uh, you'll kind of know what's going on. For those who haven't, I want to give you just a real quick run through of how hermeneutics work, and hopefully that way you're not lost. And if you're lost at the end, I apologize, but I will try not to lose you. Uh, hermeneutics, uh, it's a fancy word that just means uh, teaching you how to understand the Bible or how to interpret the scripture. Okay, so don't let uh, the word hermeneutics like scare you or it's just a big fancy word of you learning how to interpret the scripture. There's about 18 different principles of hermeneutics, a principle in how to study or how to interpret the Bible. Uh, we're only going to use about five, okay? Uh, 18 of them as pastors, we really only use five. If we were really being honest, we don't use the other 13. They don't really, they apply, but not in the setting of what we would use them for. Uh, so I wanted to uh, sync my phone to the screen and see if this works. <clears throat> I practiced this twice before church started and it worked. There it is, yay. Now, in my defense, it should be black lettering. On my phone, it's got a black screen to it, but it shows up white on your screen so it doesn't black out all the background. So anyhow, uh, well, there you go. Thank you. That was quick. Good job. Professionals back there. Uh, so there's five main principles of hermeneutics, and these are the tools in which we use uh, to interpret Scripture. Uh, the first one and the one that I know we as pastors use a lot when we're preparing for a sermon or just a teaching is the context principle. Uh, what that means is that 
when you read a single verse, then you read the verses above it and the verses below it to get the context of what the author is stating. Uh, so a lot of times uh, you'll get someone will share one single verse and it might be out of context because they're just, cher- we call it cherry picking. They'll just pick one verse and share it, and, but they don't put it in context. So it's really important to put the verse in context and we're going to do that here tonight. Uh, the second thing is the complete mention principle. What that means is uh, that when you, who you, do you have the Blue Letter Bible app on your phone? If you don't, uh, come see one of us uh, and we can help you download that on your phone. Uh, that is a great tool uh, to be able to search just about anything in the Bible. I use my Blue Letter Bible app m- the majority of the time if I'm getting ready for a sermon or just on my daily use, I'll use that a lot. And what's so handy about it, let's say you want to look up the word hope. You can type hope into the search bar and all the verses in the Bible will show up in, with, the verse, with the word hope. How many know that's pretty handy? Then you can even narrow it down to, uh, if you're looking for just verses in the Old Testament, you can put your search engine just to the Old Testament or New Testament, or maybe you know that the, the verses in Revelation, you can only search Revelation, so it really narrows it down for you. So the complete mention is, all the verses in the Bible on that particular topic, and let's say you're looking up prayer, to, to pray, you could type the word pray, prayer, praying, and it'll pull up all the verses with all those different uh, types of prayer, all the different words there. The comparative mention principle is when you're comparing something. So the book of Proverbs has a lot of compare and contrasting. Or you could, let's say, um, Jesus, he's considered the, the last Adam. Who is considered the first Adam? Adam. Yeah, not a trick question. Okay, uh, the first Adam. And then you can look at all the compare and contrast between the two. You know, one failed in the garden, one won in the garden. Uh, you, there's all kinds of really cool things you can, you can look at that. And again, we'll do an example of that tonight. Uh, then the, the fourth one, which... Uh, Pastor Jason, I don't really use that one much, the first mention. Do you use that one a whole lot, somewhat? Uh, So that one is a little harder to figure out uh, because what you're doing is you're trying to go back to the beginning of the Bible and look for where it's first mentioned. Uh, So for example, if you're looking up marriage, if you're reading in uh, Matthew and it's talking about marriage and you're a little confused, you can go back to the very beginning in Genesis and you get a very clear picture of what marriage should look like. Uh, so the first mention typically has the seed or the key in it that really unlocks uh, what that principle is talking about. So the first mention principle is an important one. Uh, we use it from time to time. The progressive mention principle, that is, let's say, and we'll, show, we'll give an example of that tonight. That one is, you might see the example in Genesis, then you'll see it again in Exodus, then you'll see it again in Psalms and then Proverbs, and you see that it keeps building, and so it's adding to itself, which is, again, I think a very powerful way to to study the scripture. That then leads us to uh, this word right here, uh, exegesis. Doesn't really sound like a good term, does it? Exegesis kind of sounds bad or negative, Uh, But that's a a fancy word. All that means is to lead out or to draw out. It's the application of hermeneutics. So as you're applying those five principles we were looking at, then you apply exegesis or the ability to lead out the truth or to draw out what is the author saying here. So if you've not attended hermeneutics, you now just got a crash course on what that looks like, and we're going to jump into uh, that. I what Pastor Jason shared last week with that phrase, care, or not phrase, but the the message that uh, Pastor Kerry shared. <clears throat> so when I look at say the this this paragraph here, uh, that word Kerry gave us, what I'm doing is I'm praying and asking God, is there a verse or is there something that you want me to apply? To this, to this word? Is there anything that would jump out it, to me, Lord, that you want to show me? And so in doing that, here's what the Lord gave me. Uh, Mark eleven twenty four. that was the verse uh, that jumped out to me as I was reading this, this paragraph here. Mark eleven twenty four reads this. Therefore, I say to you, all the things for which you pray and ask, 
Okay, so we're, are we believing and praying and asking that we would be this city? Yeah, I want to be this city, so I'm praying, I'm asking. So I'm applying Mark eleven twenty four to this. <clears throat> Believe that you have received and, and that you've received them and they will be granted to you. Now, here's how you apply hermeneutics. The first principle that I like to use the most is the context principle because that will oftentimes give you more definition to what you just read. So let's go ahead and jump up to then verse 22. And then Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God. Truly I say, whoever says to this mountain... Be taken up and cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes what he says is going to happen, it'll be granted to him. So there's a little bit of context for you. So it's kind of saying the same thing as verse 24. Uh, we already read verse 24. So now let's go to 25. Whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone so that your father who is in heaven also will forgive your transgressions. Ah, now you, you see the verse in the context of what it's written, that you, you see the, the idea of forgiveness is associated to prayer and asking, yes? Because it even goes on to verse 26. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father who is in heaven forgive your transgressions. Now, here's what I do. I take my blue letter Bible app because now I'm excited. I just saw, I looked up and I saw prayer and asking but now I see forgiveness is associated to this, right? Did you see that? So now you see that. So now I'm typing in the, like the word forgive or tra transgression or something of that nature. And now here's where some of the other verses, uh, and I'll just share them with you uh, that we'll, we'll jump into is, uh, then we'll go to uh, Matthew 6, uh, verse 9. So this is the next verse that jumped out. Actually, I'll go to, uh, I apologize, uh, I'll go to Matthew 6.6, 6. that was the, the one. But you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door, pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So that was my second verse that when I searched, pray came up. Now, again, apply the context principle, so read what's above it, below it. Uh, so I'll keep reading, because I've already read above and below uh, going down, verse 7, and when you're praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do. So are we getting some more instruction on how our prayer life should be? Yeah, he's telling you not to just repeat the same thing over and over. Uh, for they suppose they'll be heard for their many words. Many times when we pray, we think if we pray a really long, fancy prayer, that's going to impress God. God's not impressed. He's like, what's your point? You know, get to it. Uh, and then he says, don't be like them, for your father already knows what you have need of before you ask. Pretty profound. Let's keep reading. Let's see if we can find any connection between what we read in Mark eleven twenty four through 26 and now this passage. So when you pray in this way, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And what? Ah, now do you see something? Just what it said in Mark eleven twenty four, and then if you would have only stopped with Mark eleven twenty four, you would have missed something. What would you have missed? The forgiveness part, right? If you only would have just searched Mark eleven twenty four and stopped, you would have missed that forgiveness was associated to the context of what Mark eleven twenty four is saying. Likewise, if you would have read Matthew six six and stopped with just reading six through nine and said, well, I know the Lord's prayer, I'm good, but you need to understand that he, he ends this prayer with, forgive our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And I think that's pretty profound that you see that. So now you're seeing that that context principle is being applied. Uh, let's now go to another verse that had the word pray in it. Uh, Luke 18. All right, so verse 11 is the verse that popped up in regards to pray or to be praying when you search it in the Blue Letter Bible app. The Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself. God, I thank you that I'm not like the other people, swindlers, unjust adulterers, even like that tax collector. What happens if you stop with just reading that verse? 
you miss all the context, right? So now you have to read all the context. So go back, you go above and you go below. Uh, verse 10, two men went up to the temple to pray. So we know that two men are to the temple going, they're both praying, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. So then the Pharisee stood up and was praying this to himself. God, I thank you that I'm not like the other swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like that tax collector. So now the Pharisee goes in to explain himself. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all I get. But, but that tax collector, standing some distance away, was unwilling to even lift his eyes to heaven, but beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. I tell you, so this is Jesus speaking, I tell you that man, the tax collector, went to his house justified rather than the other. Wow. So here's two people praying, and the one who is seeking forgiveness in, his, in humility, what does he receive? Forgiveness. And is his prayer heard? Is his prayer heard? Yes. yes. Notice the Pharisee. Who was he praying to? What's the verse say in, in verse 11? Himself. That means his prayer has got as high as the ceiling. Right? But yet in his own heart, what did he think he was? He thought he was really good with God. He's listening. I fast. I tithe. I give my money. I show up to church. I do all the right things. And yet God said his prayer is unto himself. It's not even leaving the room. Okay, so that, to me, I think that's pretty profound, that you don't just stop with a singular verse, but you put everything in context. Uh, let's do another one. Um, if you do the Blue Letter Bible app and you search prayer, uh, James 5.17 will pop up. Okay, Verse 17, Elijah was a man like our nature, and he prayed. So if you would have put in your search engine, pray, prayed, or prayed, <laughs> prayed, <laughs> prayed, praying, <clears throat> you would have this verse pop up as one of the verses. He had prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the earth for three and a half, or three and a half years. Uh, so again, do put it in context. Go above and below. Verse 16, Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you might be healed. The effect, effectual prayer of the righteous man will accomplish much. Wow. Do you see that prayer and forgiveness are going hand in hand? That if you want your prayers heard, what should we be doing? Forgive. Not only are you asking forgiveness for yourself, but you're also praying on the behalf of other people. And again, we're going to look at some of these examples here. Uh, but just from looking at these, these passages, Mark 11, Matthew 6, Luke 18, and James 5, they're all saying just about the same thing, that when you're putting all the verses uh, in context together, okay? Uh, and so that's incorporating not only the context method, but also then the, the complete mention method. Complete mention meaning when you search those words, pray, praying, uh, prayed, you're, you're getting a whole list of verses, right? Uh, I forget the number, but it's a lot, okay, of when you see those. And so you're going through and you're asking the Holy Spirit, what verses are standing out to you, Lord, that you want me to, uh, to apply to life? Okay, so uh, moving on. Uh, forgiveness. Looking at that word that Carrie gave us, God is going to do his job, yes? Is it ever going to be God's fault? No, it's not going to be. If there's ever a reason why God doesn't move on a word, it's not his problem. It's our problem, okay? Uh, so we have always, to me, I asked myself the question in which Pastor Jason shared this last week, that when you get a prophetic 